Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate the turnout. I'm Anne Marie Galvin, I'm with you at Max Coalition. I'm, great, I'm very happy to see this crowd here tonight, so I thank you for coming. And thank you to the wonderful volunteers, the coalition leaders from all these social communities that helped promote the event, and the amazing treatment providers who said yes and say yes every time that we ask them to come. Please make sure you um, connect with them before you leave, and certainly the folks um, that are doing Narcan training for Man Community Health in the back, and Muriel from Learn to Cope. Could, Muriel, can you present? There she is. Please see um, Muriel from Learn to Cope if your family um, is suffering right now, because they're the people that can really um, give you the support you need to support your loved ones. So it's really, they're really awesome. We have local meetings in Norwell on Monday. Every, the first and third Thursday of every month is the Norwell meeting, and there are meetings weekly in Quincy and other communities around here. So um, please make sure you check them out. I appreciate it. And it is with great pleasure that I uh, introduce Dr. John F. Kelly from Massachusetts General Hospital, who can share some of his impressive resume with you. I've spent many nights reading um, his research on um, recoveryanswers.org and addictionanswers.org, that's correct, websites which are amazing resources. And he's also the assistant director of the ARMS program at Massachusetts General Hospital that helps adolescents and young adults ages 15 to 25. So he has a lot of information for us. He's a wonderful local resource and we're so grateful that you said yes and Kate battled the traffic um, from downtown Boston to situate by the sea. So thank you and we'll let Dr. Kelly get going. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks, everyone. Well, I, I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Henry, thank you for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to come and speak. I hope I'll be able to speak loud enough so you can all hear me at the back. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, I hope what I have uh, tonight will be helpful to you, uh, informative. And um, I. Let's see, I, I know I was scheduled to, to start at 7, I apologize, I took Emory right on, I was battling the traffic down here, going very, very slowly um, for about an hour, um, in the pouring rain, trying to get out of Boston, I apologize uh, for my lateness. Now, I can go later, if, if, if um, you know, until about 7, 8, 15, or I can end at 8, whatever, whatever, whatever you were like. Uh, if you can um, continue and people leave when they need you. Sure, yeah, yeah. 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 I'll, I'll, I'll end it. Uh, and uh, at 8.15, so we'll go over a little bit. Um, and um, so, thank you, um, and uh, so I'm going to talk about kind of a broad stroke overview of, of what we know, and I'll give you a few little studies uh, interspersed with this broad stroke overview uh, of the field of addiction, stigma around addiction, and treatment and recovery. <coughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit about the overall burden, the volume, and impact of uh, this very high uh, uh, prevalence disorder we have uh, called addiction or substance use disorder, um, how substances cause harm in different ways, um, how addiction is now commonly understood as a disease of the brain that attacks uh, or hijacks certain areas of the brain, and um, we talk about the clinical course of addiction and recovery, the fact that recovery is the most likely outcome for people with an addiction problem. That can be news to many people. It can take a while to get there, but it is most people actually achieve full remission and recovery from addiction. And I'm going to talk about treatment and recovery. So what do, we, what do we know about effective treatments? What kinds of factors are associated with getting people into remission and helping them stay there into long-term recovery? and what are the kinds of recovery support services available, which are growing and which are increasingly ever in space. Next slide. So one of the other things to think about when you think about addiction is uh, the life course, right? Because a life course perspective helps us kind of uh, frame our questions and, and, uh, and understand our barriers and facilitators to change when we're viewing different public health problems. And this is our number one public health problem. It's very important when you, when, you, when you look at high volume, high burden, high prevalence disorders and diseases in the population to understand where they onset, where they peak, and where they offset so that you can design appropriate intervention and prevention strategies and have the maximum impact, right? So it's important to think about when we're looking at substance use disorder and addiction, where in the in their life course, are they likely to onset? When are they likely to peak? And what are the 
one of the things that we have to consider and take into consideration when you are hoping to intervene uh, with these high burden, high volume disorders. Next slide. So as I mentioned, number one public health problem. Um, we have, uh, in terms of economic burden, we, we, we have about 23 million people who meet criteria for substance use disorder every year in the United States. Um, we have another 38 million people who drink alcohol at harmful and hazardous levels without meeting criteria for addiction that also confer a lot of um, accidents and injuries and uh, um, uh, uh, add to the, to the uh, economic burden associated with these disorders, which is approaching actually now approaching uh, about three quarters of a trillion dollars each year uh, in terms of the overall impact. Uh, we know that we have a very high alcohol, alcohol addiction is the third leading cause of maternal death, maternal death in the United States. Overdose now is the leading cause of accidental death. It's now surpassed motor vehicle accidents as the leading cause of accidental death in the United States. And we know in terms of onset that these disorders typically have their roots and onset in adolescents, late adolescents, and young adulthood. So this just gives you an idea relative to other common diseases, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, where the alcohol and drug economic burden lies. Um, in terms of the amount of money that we spend on prevention and treatment for alcohol and drug use disorders, it's only about 7%. It's actually the lowest of any of these other high volume, high burden diseases. We, we, we spend very little on prevention and treatment relative to things like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, which spend probably about 30 to 40% of the overall cost associated with those diseases are spent on prevention and treatment. Part of that is to do with stigma. So this shows you just in terms of overall burden of illness. Um, these are usually measured in things called disability adjusted life years lost. That's a combination of premature mortality associated with different conditions as well as life years <coughs> lived with disability. And we see that alcohol is the third leading, worldwide is the third leading risk factor for disease and disability. And we end life years lost. Next slide. What's also very important to mention the life course is when you look across different ages, you can see that worldwide as well as here in the Americas, um, that alcohol and drug use, if you're gonna get, die as a young person or become sick or disabled as a young person, it's gonna be, and you're male, it's gonna be almost entirely due to alcohol and illicit drugs. Um, if you're female, less so, but still, the highest proportion of the disability adjusted last year's lost uh, as a young person will be due to, to alcohol or illicit drugs. I mentioned stigma. These are the most stigmatized conditions probably in society. The World Health Organization did a, did a cross-national uh, study uh, of 18 of the most stigmatized conditions across 14 different societies, 14 different countries. Uh, and they asked, had a sample from each one of these countries, and they asked them, of these 18 different conditions, which are the, which are the most stigmatized? And these, can, these, these were things, this is very distracting, this beautiful. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and these included conditions such as um, being a criminal, having AIDS or being HIV positive, as well as being a drug addict or being an alcohol addict. And of all of these different conditions, very stigmatized conditions across 14 different countries, the number one most stigmatized condition was being a drug addict, the number four condition was being an alcohol addict. So these are very highly stigmatized conditions. The ramifications of that locally, here nationally, is that people are very reluctant to admit they have a problem, to talk about it, even with their doctor, their primary care physician, and they're very reluctant to seek help. And this creates a problem for, um, for treating, get, you know, for, for trying to do something about these uh, problems. So I was privileged and honored to be invited to the White House at the first ever na National Drug Policy Reform Summit, which was held on December 9th last year. In that summit, it was the first one ever held, it was intended to underscore a shift, a philosophical shift away from the war on drugs and towards a smarter public health approach to dealing with the addiction problem 
uh, which is now the number one public health problem. What I talked about and why I was invited was because I've done research in this area of stigma and the language that we use. Next slide. One of the things that's very important is that we actually, and this surprised me, and it surprised many other people, that the language that we use to describe these conditions and people who have them actually may make a difference to how people perceive them and the likelihood that somebody's going to get treatment versus more punitive measures, okay? Lock them up versus treat them, okay? Um, and um, there are two major factors which influence stigma. One is cause and the other one is controllability. So can they help it and can they control it? Okay. So these are the two kind of major factors which contribute to stigma. Um, the more that people perceive that somebody contracted an illness that wasn't their fault, the more sympathy and compassion they're likely to um, engender. And also, uh, the, the less voluntary control that somebody has over that disorder, uh, the more sympathy and compassion they're likely to engender. Um, what we do know about addiction is about half the risk of addiction is conferred by genetics. Okay. So just like other kinds of illnesses, people are much more susceptible to contracting that particular illness if you have a genetic predisposition. And about half the risk is conferred by genetics. Like many illnesses, it's interaction between genes and environment. I'll show you that in a bit more detail. The other thing is controllability. Yes, when people start using drugs and alcohol, there's a, there's a lot of control, ability to self-regulate. But as people go on, they use it frequently and intensively, the brain actually changes. The prefrontal cortex, which regulates impulses to use, becomes impaired, and that decision to stop is usually overridden in people who become addicted. So that even despite very severe consequences, it cannot make that decision in the short term to not become. And this is the essence and the nature of addiction. What I wanted to look at here was the different kinds of terms which are commonly used uh, in the addiction field. One was, one was the, the, the substance abuse term. So you often hear people described, even in federal literature, in the National Institute of Drug Abuse, people described as substance abusers. Okay? And whereas I prefer, and I think many people would argue that, prefer using term like substance use disorder would convey a different kind, kind of meaning. So here, describing someone as a substance abuser, many people think, including myself, that you're describing someone as somebody who has volition, they're in control, they're a perpetrator. This confers more of a medical term which is associated with a public health approach, which is associated with someone who has a disorder. Uh, in other words, more of a victim of, of the illness. So I wanted to see experimentally, if you expose people to each one of these terms, does it um, create different judgments about individuals, the same individual who suffers from addiction? Next thing. So we did a randomized study where we randomized, next slide, a vignette. In half, these were mental health clinicians, 561 mental health clinicians, mostly doctoral level, okay? Um, uh, about a third were addiction specialists. Half of them got this paragraph, half of them got this paragraph. The only difference between these two paragraphs is that in this paragraph, Mr. Williams, <coughs> who's got a drug addiction, now on drug addiction problem, is described as a substance abuser. And in this one, the other half of the audience got, in, in this, uh, this con uh, conference, got this paragraph. The only difference is that Mr. Williams has a substance use disorder. Okay. And guess what happened? We asked, we asked the audience to describe, is the person more to blame for their problem? Should they receive treatment? Should they be, be, receive some kind of punitive measure for, for the violation of the court program that Mr. Williams was in? And depending on whether someone was exposed to the vignette describing him as a substance abuser versus a substance use disorder, they made different judgments. And you can see here they're highlighted. If, if they were exposed to the, the vignette where he was the exact same person who was described as a substance abuser, they were more likely to view the person uh, um, as, as less in need of treatment, more in need of punishment, more of a social threat, more to blame, less likely to be exonerated, and more likely to be able to control their problem and therefore be more likely to be blamed and punished. Next. 
So what's really interesting about this is even though we're not often conscious of the language that we use, um, is that it may um, evoke an implicit cognitive bias towards a more punitive judgment towards individuals who suffer from these conditions. So it does make a difference, the language that we use, and I think it will behoove us uh, all to try and get rid of this abuser term, the abuse and abuser term, and replace it with other kinds of terms, unhealthy use or misuse, um, and describe individuals as individuals with a substance use disorder. In other words, using person-first language, as has been done now and, and has been pushed in the mental health field for a long time. An individual suffering from or having depression as opposed to a depressive or schizophrenic, for example. Um, individual suffering from or having a substance use disorder is preferable to describing someone as a substance abuser. Uh, the eating disorders field has got this right, right? People with eating disorders are always referred to as having an eating disorder, never as food abusers, right? And so we can, we can take note from that, that universally, it's just a habit. People always talk about eating disorders, never food abusers. <coughs> Um, and I think it's something that we can adopt, and now there's evidence to suggest that it may, it may actually lead to more punitive biases. Next slide. So what is addiction? As I mentioned, we now talk about addiction as a brain disease that is associated with impairment in the neurocircuitry of reward, motivation, memory, impulse control, and judgment. And there are different parts of the brain because uh, drugs and alcohol affect have to, uh, uh, diffuse effects on different systems in, within the brain. Next slide. So these are this is the front of the brain here, this is the back of the brain. You see this is the limbic system here, this is the reward, uh, reward pathway that, that gets affected. There are different parts, I won't go into this too much, but uh, this, this affects the ability to, 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 to make judgments, appraise situations, and regulate impulses where the impulses come from, from the, the ward circuitry, and all these different aspects of the brain get affected and damaged and changed through a process of neuroadaptation, and I'll talk about that, and also neurotoxicity. <coughs> Next slide. As I mentioned before, <coughs> this illness, like many other illnesses, is an interaction between <coughs> genes and environment. You can have the genetic predisposition for many diseases, but you will never manifest the disease because you're never exposed to the right environmental conditions. So you do need to be exposed to it. You need to be exposed to it actually under certain conditions. Even with someone who has a propensity towards developing addiction, may get some limited exposure, for example, to alcohol, but not enough to turn on those genes, which leads to a manifestation of the illness. Um, so you need a kind of a right kind of environmental, environmental exposure. What we've seen with opiates is that uh, people who may not ordinarily uh, use a drug like an opiate because we see this uh, prescription opiate ep epidemic increased accessibility to prescribed opiates that are perceived as safe, people who would not normally try a drug are trying drugs like opiates because they were once prescribed in the perception of safety. So that in combination with their own biology and genes can lead to an increased risk and that's what we see an increased prevalence of opiate addiction now um, that's a pathway through which has been uh, prescribed opiates uh, which are particularly seductive and when they're misused can turn on genes for people who are susceptible and lead to uh, repeated use which can actually change the brain leading to addiction. Next slide. So um, we often by default talk about addiction, and I mentioned this earlier, that there are 38 million people who don't meet criteria, for example, for alcohol addiction, but use enough alcohol to cause actually health problems as well as accidents uh, in, in their life. And there are three <coughs> main pathways through which substances cause harm. The one that we're used to talking about, which I tend to by default, kind of, by default talk about addiction, right? Talk about addiction problems. Um, but many people don't actually meet criteria for addiction, they don't have an addiction problem. In other words, they can self-regulate their use, they can turn it off and on, but they still have a problem through these different pathways. We're familiar with addiction causing mortality and, and other kinds of diseases and problems. But there are these two other pathways too. 
One is one we've all heard of, which is intoxication. Right? People getting intoxicated on a substance, with alcohol, they can fall down the stairs, they can get into a fight, they can crash their car, and they can have all kinds of accidents and injuries. Another one which is um, uh, not often thought about is toxicity. So certain drugs cause toxic effects. Classic one, of course, is alcohol. Uh, on the liver can cause cirrhosis over many years of use, uh, hepatitis, um, fatty liver, um, and uh, it can also cause uh, brain damage and it can cause cancer. Uh, we know that alcohol is a level one carcinogen. It's in the same category as asbestos. So it, it does cause cancer in, in, in a linear relationship with increased <coughs> risk, increased risk of breast cancer, and <coughs> esophageal cancer, and a variety of other cancers. Next slide. So I mentioned this notion of neuroadaptation. Ironically, addiction is a process that it, it, it's, it's a kind of a, a paradox in that the brain tries to adapt, does its best to try and accommodate and adapt to the presence of the drug. And when we take drugs in a high concentration, such as we do if we're addicted, is that the brain doesn't like actually it doesn't like that high degree of intense release of, of those neurochemicals in the brain. Um, and what it will try to do is adapt and adjust to, to the present. Now our bodies are very good at adapting and adjusting to all kinds of things. Um, some of you may have, you know, um, played the guitar, um, and you when you play the guitar, you get calluses on your on your fingers, right? You get blisters at first, and then your body adapts and produces skin, hardened skin, right, on the ends of your fingers. So then you can't feel those. <coughs> you play the guitar, and uh, you don't feel it at all, right? You think, great, this is great. Doesn't, doesn't, there's no pain anymore from doing it. The downside, of course, is that you can't feel the ends of your fingers very well because the end of your fingers become desensitized. The same thing happens in the brain, is that your brain adapts to what is thrown at it. And your brain is very good. It's like the rest of your body. You will try and adjust and adapt. When you take a high potency uh, drug uh, into your system, you release a neurochemical. You release many neurochemicals, but one of them, and which is the primary one for which we experience pleasure, is called dopamine. I'm sure many of you have heard of that chemical. Um, and when you take a drug, it releases a lot of dopamine. With methamphetamine, for example, it's 1,200 percent above basal level for what you would normally perceive in a general rewarding experience. 1,200 percent higher than that when you take a drug like methamphetamine, for example. And that experience for the brain is kind of like that's way too loud. The brain's saying that's way too much dopamine really. So what it will do is it will actually start to downregulate reduce the number of receptors into which dopamine will fit. <coughs> okay. Now what does that mean? It means that if the brain is doing this, then the other part of the brain says, wait a minute, I'm not hearing that experience the way I used to hear it. I'm not experiencing that pleasure the way I used to uh, experience it when I first started using the drug. So what is the person addicted to? They will turn it up a little bit more. And the brain will say, whoa, that's still, that's, that's even louder. Even louder. I'm going to dig my things with you deeper, and the brain does it. it kind of, the addicted person then fights a losing battle of increasing use and decreasing availability of those receptors into which the dopamine fits. So what happens that translates into uh, this notion of taking more dopamine <coughs> effect. We call that tolerance or neuroadaptation. Now, while that's going on, of course, um, it, it's a process, and when a person tries to stop. What happens? The brain doesn't suddenly snap back into normal mode again if somebody's been using for months or years or decades. The brain doesn't suddenly snap back into place any more than the if I stopped playing the guitar for a, for, for a week that my fingers would, would pull that hard skin would go away. It would, it would take a, a number of weeks for that to, to go away. It turns out the brain is similar. It's, it will take a while for that brain to say, oh, I think it's safe now to take my fingers down my ears because I don't think that high volume release of dopamine is coming down the pipe. Um, and it will start to readjust and re-upregulate those receptors. And that is what recovery is in the brain. Is that, and that's why it's so difficult for people early on to recover, is because they cannot experience pleasure at the normal level because the brain is not hearing it. It's kind of a hedonic deafness going on. 
where the brain has still got its fingers stuck in its ears, and it can't, even long levels of dopamine is not going to pick up. So people have this dysphoria early on, they feel down, they feel general malaise, they feel lack of energy, they can't really experience kind of good feelings. Uh, a, a nice view like this would be kind of blah for people early in recovery, a sunny day, going out with friends, going to see a good movie. That is not that much fun for people early in recovery because they just cannot experience that sensation of pleasure early on. The good news is, is that with abstinence, the brain does upregulate and change again so that people can start to experience pleasure. As I mentioned this already, that uh, after, you know, one of my colleagues always says, you know, if, if drugs and alcohol and, and these experiences are so pleasurable, how come we're not all addicted? How come we're not all addicted to these things, right? The, the reason is, is because some of us just don't like the effects. Some of us are able to say, well, well this is, you know, take a leave. Other of us like, just give me more. I want more and more of that. Okay? And, and, and that's the difference. Just the same as some of us like certain foods, other of us like other foods. It, it's kind of genetically influenced preferences for certain uh, things that we're exposed to. The same is true of addiction. Next slide. Okay. I showed you this, but I wanted to show you about the onset of substance use disorder. So these are from population, population data that get every year. Um, in this country, about 7,000 households are surveyed okay, every single year. It's called the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. And what this shows is these are ages at the bottom. Here's 12, 13-year-olds up to 65 plus. Um, and you can see there's 18, 20-year-olds. And these are the darker colors here are more severe alcohol and drug problems. Uh, and as you can see, the pink of these more severe problems occurs in late adolescence and early adulthood. But they onset, they're peaking, they're growing in, uh, in, in late adolescence. Okay, this is where we see the illness beginning to take its root. So if from a public health perspective you are wanting to prevent and do something about these illnesses, these very high volume, high burden diseases in the population, you'd probably be wanting to do something back here. Right? What we normally do is we wait till everybody's gotten addicted, and then we say, well, we're, we're opening the door to our treatment facility, so come on in when you're ready. Okay. Now, that's, a, that's not a smart approach. A smart approach when you're dealing with three quarters of a trillion dollars in impact, negative impact, every single year in terms of lost productivity, criminal justice, and healthcare costs, you want to be doing something a little bit more aggressively early on. That means screening, early screening for adolescents, and brief interventions and other interventions for people who are developing more severe problems. Next slide. The other thing that's very important is there are critical periods in development. Okay, this is why this life course perspective is so important. There are critical periods in, in brain development. We know that the brain develops from the inside out and from back to front. The last part of the brain to develop is this, this front part, the uh, prefrontal cortex, which is associated with higher reasoning and executive function. Like I said, regulating impulses, appraisal of situations, judgment, and things like that, abstract reasoning. And we know that during this period of adolescence is that the brain is particularly susceptible to the impact of alcohol and other drugs, like it's even marijuana. Next slide. So this shows um, these are different cohorts. This is the percent of people using prior to age 15. Okay? These are cohorts for the 1930s. 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, up to uh, 1990. Now, what we're seeing in cohorts born after 1960, an increased use of underage of, of use, particularly below, before the age of 15, as well as marijuana here in the red. Next one. The consequence of that is there's a strong relationship between early exposure, this is independent of genetic risk. So, early exposure to alcohol in the developing brain increases the risk that you're going to have an alcohol use disorder later on in your life. So there's a reason why uh, we have minimum drinking ages. This is one of them. The other, of course, is, is impulsivity and, and, and car crashes. That was the reason why it was, it was raised to begin with. But the other thing is, is that it produces neurotoxic effects that have lifelong ramifications. That's right. Coincidentally, these are data from these are data from a different cohort, and they show the same kind of thing. 
that in cohorts born after 1950, the rates of alcohol dependence among women who were born after 1950 had tripled, even though they've lived a, 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 a less long period of their life than women who were born before 1950. So if you're born after 1950, you're, you have three times the rates of alcohol dependence than women born the night before 1950. Among men, it's double. This is a, a longitudinal study. This is showing the effects of uh, marijuana. Of course, we got from uh, marijuana is all over the media right now because of the, the law changes and the medical marijuana and so on. And this is a, a, a prospective study looking at the effect of marijuana on neurocognitive functioning among about 1,200 people who were followed up from the age of 13 up to the age of 38. So 25 years, prospective study, they followed the same people. And they measured their neurocognitive status before they started using any substances at age 13. And they measured them over time, repeatedly over time, to look at the impact of different things like alcohol, like marijuana, uh, on the development, on the neurocognitive development. Next slide. What they found was that controlling for other factors that could um, account for the relationship between um, marijuana use, this is particularly focused on marijuana, uh, and neurocognitive functioning, what they found was that people who had used marijuana during their teenage years heavily was that they had an eight point uh, decline in their IQ over this period of time. Now, eight points is almost one standard deviation. That means going roughly from the 50th percentile down to the 28th percentile. So that's quite a big drop in neurocognitive functioning. Um, and what they found was that even if the person had stopped using for a year or more, they still showed this neurocognitive decline in age 30. But only in relation to teenage years. So there's this critical period of development which is very important to the developing brain not to be exposed. Incidentally, when you ask people themselves if they notice a, a decline in their neurocognitive functioning, they often say, no, don't notice any difference. But you can show a decline. You can show a consistent, reliable decline in neurocognitive function that's attributable to the uh, use. What was interesting in this study is they also asked people in the environment, all the people in the study, and they asked people in their environment do you notice any different, any 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 problems that your loved one has in their uh, memory and attention? And they found that uh, only the people who had smoked uh, uh, marijuana as a teenager showed this this observable, observable difference in their attention and memory at age 38. Next slide. The other thing to remember about addiction, I alluded to this a little bit, that I said at the beginning that most people who have addiction will achieve sustained remission. That's true. We know now from lots of prospective studies and lots of retrospective studies, asking people uh, to think back over time and also following people up over time, that about 60% of people will, will achieve full sustained remission and recovery from substance use. <coughs> That's the good news. It's actually a good prognosis disorder. The bad news is, is that it can take a while to get there. Okay? So we know in adult studies that it takes about four to five years on average. Like I said, there's a lot of stigma and shame and embarrassment around uh, alcohol drug use disorders that people don't want to seek help. They don't want to talk about it. Uh, they try to keep it to themselves if possible. Um, and it takes about four to five years of people trying to manage it, trying to cut down, trying to stop, trying to do things in adult studies. Um, before they'll actually go to see specialty care. Once they see, see specialty care, it takes about eight years on average to get one year of full sustained remission. Okay. About eight years on average before someone gets one full year of action. Now during that time, we're about you know, getting about three to four or five different treatments, attending mutual health organizations. Um, and they're making progress. What we do know now is that people make progress over time. So they may get a month and then have a relapse, and they get three months, and have a relapse, and they get six months, of, until they get that full year of, of, of abstinence and remission. What's also interesting is that even when people achieve that full year of abstinence, full year of remission, it takes about five years before the risk of relapse in the next year drops below 15%. So 15% is lifetime risk. 
So for anybody in the general population out there, their lifetime risk of, of, of having a substance use disorder is 15%, somewhere in your in the course of your life. Okay? So to get down to that level, it takes five years of, of remission to get down below that general risk. So your risk is not higher. So we're talking about uh, a disorder that is susceptible, vulnerable to relapse. Of course, we've seen in the media relatively recently, people who've had many decades of relapse, never, the risk never is zero, of course. Just like other illnesses, you have to manage it. And it takes you know, constant vigilance to manage this over time. Next slide. The good news is this. Early intervention will shorten the time to remission, just like other kinds of illnesses. If you had cancer, you catch it early, you intervene, your prognosis is much better. The same is true of substance use disorders. And this is a study we've done in Illinois where they looked at people, that's about 1,500 people. We found that people who, after their first use, had gotten some kind of treatment in the first nine years after their use, had about a seven year uh, uh, shorter time to remission than people who waited later to access treatment. So earlier intervention produced a much shorter time to remission. Next slide. Yes, this is a long, a long prospective study, long -term, a long term study of people with um, opiate, these were heroin. Um, uh, addicted people. This is a 33 year study. So, this is one of the longest studies that we have out there published. So, following the same people up for 33 years over time who were involved in the California um, the criminal justice system, caught the heroin at a young age and then followed up over time. Next slide. And uh, so, there were 475 uh, young males recruited. Uh, next slide. And what they found was these are the factors associated with abstinence over time, including employment, low drug severity, receiving more treatment, next slide. And this is what I was saying, is that what they found in this study, this is relative to their first uh, attempt, or their next attempt, how much more abstinence they got at each, at each successive attempt. So from the first to the second attempt, they got 22% more days abstinence. At the third attempt, they got about the same, again, a building on that. And then they got about 40. So you see how people progressed over time in the study in terms of achieving more and more longer periods of abstinence, culminating in, 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 in about 60% of the sample achieved full sustained addiction. Next slide. The other thing to remember about addiction is we are now really understanding and talking about and starting slowly to treat addiction as a chronic condition. Right? You probably heard of people talking about it as a chronic condition, as a chronic illness. It's not chronic for everybody, but for the kind of people that we see coming into specialty treatment, <coughs> about 2.5 million people every year, it does take a chronic form and it does tend to require ongoing monitoring and management all the time. The relapse rate, when you view it as a chronic illness as opposed to an acute illness, as we historically have done, which we are still to some extent treating it as, uh, we see that the relapse rates or the non-compliance rates are similar to other chronic illnesses like diabetes, hypertension, and asthma. There's no difference to other kinds of chronic illnesses in terms of people's relapse rate and compliance rate. So what are the factors that help people achieve remission and recovery? One of them I already mentioned is early detection. Right? Doing a better job of screening, early intervention, uh, brief intervention, and uh, more intensive intervention when necessary at an early age when people have been onset. The good news is now we are changing. We are starting to do more screening um, and uh, uh, brief intervention with adolescents. There's detox, of course, and withdrawal management. There is uh, psychological and social interventions. There are medications. We have a number of FDA approved medications to treat addiction. Um, Treatment of other kinds of uh, comorbid psychiatric illnesses like depression and anxiety disorders as well as psychosis. Uh, continuing care and recovery monitoring as mutual health organizations like AA. Next slide. So, um, with opiates, of course, we have um, methadone, opiate agonists, and suboxone, which is a combination of um, uh, buprenorphine and naltrexone. And we also have naltrexone by itself, which is an antagonist, right, blocks the effects of opioid receptors, um, and that's shown to be um, uh, effective with people with opioid addiction. 
What this slide shows, these are national data, and you can see here, these are people uh, trying a drug for the first time, okay, initiates. These are past initiates of trying an illicit drug for the first time. And what we've seen is this dramatic rise in pain release, so as I mentioned. So marijuana has always been high, other than alcohol. Uh, these are illicit drugs. So, but the next highest one has been, is, is pain release. Okay. We all know about this. Um, is that uh, you know, many of these um, drug coalitions and, and new support groups have come along because of the opioid crisis. And this is uh, uh, reflecting that. Next slide. Uh, these are people who meet um, for uh, a, a substance use disorder. And these are, in the past year, these are national data, 73,000 sample. And you see marijuana is the, uh, the highest. And then there's two, pain relief. Okay, and these are opiate analogies of pain relief, <laughs> prescription pain relief. Now, is the number two uh, substance use disorder uh, among, among, in the population. Next slide. And this is um, the, um, the substance for which most people receive treatment. Um, see, alcohol, marijuana, the number three now is pain relief. So that's moved way up, uh, way up, way up the list in terms of people needing treatment. So what about medications? This is a study that looked at buprenorphine, um, uh, suboxone, buprenorphine, and naloxone, um, and um, it was a randomized controlled trial, um, as you see, within subjects. Next slide. So what they did was they had two phases, and they gave people a brief treatment with suboxone, um, and then they uh, tapered them off over two weeks and had an eight-week follow-up. And then what they did was look to see how many people in the original uh, cohort who received the suboxone can take it off at eight weeks were abstinent from opiates, okay? And then those who were um, unsuccessful at achieving abstinence for death were then given another eight weeks of, um, or 12 weeks of suboxone with a four week, a four week taper off of suboxone followed by an eight week follow up and the successful outcome was minimal and no opiate use. There was a pretty big sample of 653 people seeking treatment. And this was for prescription opiate dependence, okay? not heroin, but prescription opiate. The average age was 33 in the sample, and most of us were between 23 and 43. Next one. What they found in phase one, this was where they had the, um, the four weeks of oxone and then the taper. Only 7% of people at the end of the eight week follow up actually were opiate free. So it was very high rate of return to opiates. So what they did in phase two was they, um, people who were unsuccessful, which was most people, they had them get back to suboxone, and of those at the eight week follow up, 49% had a successful outcome while they were not taking the suboxone. When they were taken off the suboxone, the outcome um, went back to roughly 7%. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the, uh, our approach to uh, addiction is starting to shift. It's starting to take a shift. It takes a while for this to happen, for systems and cultures to change. Our treatment culture is really set up as an acute care model. It's set up as an acute stabilization, detoxification, and discharge. Okay? That's not the way you treat the chronic ones. You don't discharge people who have chronic illnesses. You keep them in care and you monitor and manage them over time. And it's starting to shift. This is a book I wrote with, with Bill White, um, who is really a, an architect of a lot of the recovery movement. Some of you may know him. Um, and uh, has done a lot of great work in this, in this area. Next slide. So here's an example of a long term recovery management approach. So this is really akin to treating addiction as a chronic illness. In this study, what they did, which was done in Illinois, Chicago, they um, they randomized these uh, drug-dependent patients uh, in Chicago, and uh, they had them stabilized, detoxify, detoxify, and stabilize. And then, much like you would treat diabetes in, a, in an outpatient clinic, they had them randomized. Half the patients were randomized to a quarterly assessment, so a quarterly checkup, uh, what they call a recovery management checkup, okay, which was assessment and assessment done. But just, just an assessment only. In the other condition to which the half the patients were randomized, they had the assessment, but the assessment 
And with the assessment was the feedback, the data that was collected was fed back to the patient. This is how you're doing. This is where you score on these on these scales. This is um, what your blood test shows. And um, if they've relapsed, then they were linked to a, uh, a person who could get them back into treatment. Okay. So those are the two, two, two separate arms. One was just assessment only every quarter. One was assessment plus the feedback and the linkage if they needed it. What we found, this is a four-year study, because we did every quarter for four years after this initial treatment episode. What they found was the people who got the feedback and the referral got back into treatment three years earlier almost, 32 months before the, the, the other group who only got the assessment. So they got back three years earlier back into treatment. And it made a difference, next slide. It made a difference in terms of abstinence, next slide. And it also made a difference in terms of cost. So here's another thing, right? So we have to think about not just what effects can we get from the treatment intervention or recovery support service, but how much is it going to cost? Okay, so it's what effect at what price. What they found in this study, even though it was a pretty low intensity intervention, right? There's not much time and effort involved in these quarterly assessment checkups, but it was still cost effective even when you factored in the cost of extra treatment. So even people getting into treatment three years earlier, they had more, they used more healthcare resources, but the overall impact was actually they used it was less of a burden to society in terms of the medical costs, criminal justice, and um, lost productivity. These are some of the other things that are associated with long-term recovery. We have recovery mutual health organizations like Alcoholics Anonymous is the most famous, but there are many others. Uh, but right now, Recovery High Schools across Massachusetts is, is one of the exemplars in that regard. Um, we have a growing burden in collegiate recovery support programs all over the United States. And I speak every year at the National Collegiate Recovery uh, Support uh, Conference, which is a growing conference um, uh, where uh, all the people who, 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 who do these police recovery programs get fantastic resources because colleges generally are kind of recovery hostile environments, right? <laughs> <laughs> so in order to help people get back into, uh, you know, get an education, go back to college or go to college, um, these great resources can really help people get in the door and provide support for them there. There are also recovery community centers. Uh, I'm just starting a study in the fall that will evaluate these recovery community centers. These are like senior centers. Uh, they're, they're, they're growing all over the United States, and they provide instrumental as well as emotional support in locations in high-risk communities, uh, like a senior center, but for people uh, with addiction problems. And there are recovery community organizations. Every single state in the United States has a recovery community organization. These are grassroots organizations that are run uh, and supported by individuals in recovery in Massachusetts it's called the Massachusetts Organization for the Addiction Recovery. Is that here? Very Yes. Very Yes. Hi, Doctor. Here you go. See? Am I, am I doing good? You are the best. <laughs> I didn't know you were here. I'm honest. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. So, more um, is another, you know, it's our Massachusetts Organization. Fabulous. Every single uh, state has one. There are people like Marianne. Uh, are my heroes and all the work that they do and all the work that we do here. Uh, next slide. So one of the things that we've seen now is a burgeoning of evidence in support of recovery support services. There's more coming online all the time. <coughs> one of the oldest, of course, is Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. And we've had, this is just like the number of studies, there have been hundreds of published studies now uh, on looking at Alcoholics Anonymous, in particular, but also Narcotics Anonymous. This research was really called um, by the Institute of Medicine, who back in 1990 said, we've got to have more research on AA. There's so much AA out there. There's, you know, there's 1.2 million people uh, going to AA every week. Uh, there's 56,000 meetings every week. 3% of them are from need more rigorous evidence. And um, that really, that call from the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences really legitimized serious scientific investigations into groups such as Alcoholics Anonymous. And we said it's a significant increase in the scientific rigor applied to groups like AA. Next slide. What we found, in fact, is that groups like AA, AA in particular, but probably, and that's what we've got the most evidence on, is that they confer, they produce benefits that are on par with professional interventions. When they're compared with professional interventions, surprisingly, 
peers can produce the same magnitude of benefit as professional intervention. And this has been shown repeatedly now in randomized controlled trials. Um, so that's the good news because AA and groups like AA are free. Okay, so they're very cost effective. And we know now that facilities that, treatment facilities that refer patients and help link patients into groups like AA not only have better outcomes, but they actually reduce the burden on the health care system because people are not using the emergency room, they're not relapsing, they stay in remission longer, and they actually use less health care resources. So how do they do that? You think about this with the recovery support service, and you think about common precursors to relapse. Uh, we know that people, places, and things, so cues in the environment, right, triggers people, places, and things which become strongly associated with with drugs and alcohol. So when people are trying to abstain, there's this very strong association with certain people, places, and things, which can elicit cravings, which can increase the risk of relapse. We know that stress, also both negative stresses and positive stresses, positive stresses being like you know, weddings and how they stay sober, how they celebrate sober, these can be stresses that can lead to relapse, as well as the negative stress associated with negative effort and drug induced. So having the priming dose of a drug, having a little bit a little bit of alcohol, a little bit of cocaine, a little bit of marijuana. I'm only going to have just this one night, that's it. I'm not going to have any more, but I'm just going to allow myself. That priming dose can increase the risk of relapse too. So these recovery support services like Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Recovery High Schools, Recovery Community Centers, they can help reduce this risk by helping to change the social network, the psychology of individuals in terms of coping skills, people's confidence and their motivation over time in the environments in which they live. We also know that activities change our brain, like I mentioned to you. Just abstinence is going to change your brain, okay, because the brain will readjust, it will recalibrate and regulate itself in terms of uh, its receptors. Uh, there are other things that happen also. Uh, in mutual health groups, for example, there's lots of evidence to show that going to AA will increase your abstinence coping skills. You'll be able to cope with situations better. You're able to you boost people's confidence in their ability to cope with situations, both social situations and situations where they're having to abstain when they're feeling negative affect, like anger, frustration, boredom, depression, and anxiety. You see? Here's a long-term study that we did with adolescents. This was an eight-year follow-up of adolescents treated average age 16 in San Diego and followed up for eight years with the young couple. And we looked at the participation in 12 steps to the health groups over time, and the relationship with them had for a long term outcome. We had about 160 um, adolescents in this, in this study, and we looked at all kinds of factors which predicted outcome over this transition, this very high risk transition into the young adult. Group. And what we found was that AA and NA, independent of formal treatment and aftercare and other factors that predicted better outcomes, the participation in AA and NA predicted better outcomes overall. Um, the magnitude of that effect was for every meeting that they attended, they gained an extra two days of abstinence over and above the abstinence that they gained from other kinds of uh, beneficial practice. So roughly three meetings a week was associated with complete abstinence over the end of the period. Next slide. So this shows you the relationship between abstinence and uh, participation in AA. These were the abstainers over the entire eight years. These are people who abstained. And you can see there, this is weekly AA and NA. And they, at each follow-up time point, under the eight years, they, uh, they attended significantly more AA and NA meetings that was associated with the abstinence. Next slide. I mentioned this already, but uh, this is a very important point with healthcare reform and accountable care organizations, is that um, programs that refer patients, that help link patients to free community resources like AA and NA have been shown not only to produce higher remission rates, but also to, re to reduce healthcare costs. This was a study that was done in the VA, and they compared five 10 programs, okay, so there's a couple thousand patients from 10 different programs. Half the programs made strong linkages to AA and NA. The other half of the programs, treatment programs, are only known that they did not. They did not make strong linkages. They didn't hardly refer patients to AA or NA. What they found was that the programs that referred patients to AA and NA got them more involved and went to AA and NA more, got a sponsor, were more likely to be involved. 
they were about one third more likely to be abstinent at one and two years post treatment relative to programs, treatment programs that did not link patients to AA and NA. And the patients that uh, were coming from programs which didn't get the AA referral were more likely to use more healthcare resources. They had more inpatient days, they had more outpatient days during the two years. <coughs> There was no difference between these two patient groups at, at Inter, interesting one. Um, now, the difference in healthcare costs, even though the, the patients who were coming from this, the programs that had a strong linkage to AA and NA, um, the, uh, they used 8,000, they were more likely to absent, those patients were more likely to be absent. They had about $8,000 lower healthcare costs over that two year period per patient. So when you multiply that just by the people in the study, that's about $15 million over that two years that, that, that the healthcare system <coughs> through making that referral. Like I said, to free community resources which can sustain remission in the community in which people live. And this is another study which has been done, similar study looking at healthcare costs costs out with adolescents. In this study, they followed adolescents up after addiction treatment up to seven years prospectively. And they found that these young people who were attending AA and NA have much better outcomes. And for every meeting that they attended, they saved about $145 in healthcare costs. Next slide. So, so I've taken you through, in a hurry, pretty fast way, uh, uh, all of these different issues, right? So this is really just the summary of where we've been. I've taken through describing this high volume, high burden, number one public health problem that we need to do a better job with in terms of especially early intervention, right? Early, uh, detecting it early, starting to uh, make a difference earlier on. We know that if we, if we start to intervene earlier, the time to remission, impact will be less. Um, we know that substances cause harm in different ways, right? I've talked about addiction, but there's also these other ways that can cause harm, intoxication and toxicity. Um, we know also that addiction is a disease of the brain. It attacks the neurocircuitry of reward, motivation, and memory, impulse control, and judgment. It changes these uh, different pathways in the brain, and it's really the body's best attempt to overcome the insult caused by drugs that is, creates the difficulty. The good news is this, is that most people recover from addiction. It can take a while to get there, but the key is persistence, ongoing monitoring, ongoing management, like other chronic illnesses. That's the way that we have to think about it, that's the way that we have to talk about it, and, and do something about it. And we now have a number of evidence-based treatments acute treatments in terms of medication, psychosocial treatments, residential treatments, long-term recovery support, mutual health groups like AA and NA for free in the community, and an increasing array of different kinds of recovery support services, like recovery high schools, police recovery programs, recovery community centers, which all play and will play an important role in reshaping our recovery landscape that will make it a much a more effective and smart approach to addressing this number one public health problem. As I mentioned at the beginning, that the, we are shifting away. It takes a, a long time. It's like trying to turn around a tanker in the ocean. You know, you have a mile long tanker out there and you're trying to bring it to the hole and turn it around. It takes a long time for these things to happen. The good news is that for the first time, there was, there was a National Drug Policy Reform Summit held last year, which really marked that shift. So, but I hope, and the reason why you're all here is we're doing something about it. And that's the good news. Now we have, you know, people like Marianne Fragulis, we have these recovery community organizations in every single state. They're facing the voices of recovery. Uh, there's a movement towards making this shift to create a really um, a change in this endemic public health problem that we have had in our hands. So I want to thank you again, Emory, for inviting me. And if we have the time for a few questions. Okay. So if anybody wants to uh, we'll also stick around for a few minutes. Could you uh, talk about any of the medications that help for uh, alcohol you know, providers? Yeah. I know the last time I'll be mentioned is the heroin. <coughs> uh, 
the off-duty, but not for alcohol. Yeah, yeah. So for alcohol dependence, there are three FDA-approved medications. There's um, uh, naltrexone, um, which is a brand name Rivia. Um, and that is an oral medication which is um, designed to uh, attenuate cravings and, um, or, or attenuate the reinforcing properties of alcohol. So you take the medication and it reduces um, the intensity of use uh, for naltrexone. And that's also used in an opiate addiction too. Okay. Uh, then there's uh, a camprosate, uh, which is a different mechanism, a hoarding mechanism for a camprosate. Can you that's spell that? A camprosate, A C A M P. A camp, R O S A T E, uh, yeah. and, and that's another FDA approved medication, a slightly different mechanism. They're both shown roughly to have a similar magnitude effect. One of them works through attenuated craving, so a camprosate seems to have a bit of a stronger effect, and meta analyses have been done on um, reducing any drinking at all, the camprosate. So that can help people sustain complete abstinence. Now, perhaps on help people if they do sweat and they do relapse to minimize the extent to which they drink because they don't get the reinforcing uh, properties of, of alcohol. Uh, and the other one is disulfiram or antabuse. Uh, antabuse has been around for a long time, since the 1940s, and that actually operates a very different mechanism. Essentially, it blocks the breakdown of alcohol, so if you, if you drink while you're taking antabuse, you can get very sick. Antabuse is typically only effective if you have a contract where you're taking it and, and being monitored by a, someone in your, in your environment, like a spouse or a partner who lives with you, and you're contracted to take it, you know, and you, take, you agree to take it every morning in front of that person. If you, take, if you do that, the rates of remission and effort are very high. It's the most effective, but you have to have that kind of setup. And, and it's also an injectable form of naltrexone called Libertol, which is once a month injection. That's shown also to be effective with alcohol examples. Um, and there are other ones that are uh, not FDA approved yet, like pyramid um, and baclofen, which are two newer medications that may be FDA approved um, soon. Pyramid um, may, may be one that's approved, approved next. Great question. Yeah, and um, how long does it take for the for the brain to kind of readjust and recalibrate? And it really varies a lot, but it depends on you know the type of drug that you've been using, how intensively you've been using it, for how long. It also you know depends on whether you've been eating food and things like that as well. Haven't been eating for many years, but you know when you think about recovery. Generally, you said, well, probably six to 18 months in that period, you know, when you start to, you start to see people returning to what looks like a similar, you know, with the normal age match control drugs, who hasn't misused so much, then you probably, you know, six to 18 months to see the uh, approaching uh, in terms of the brain uh, descent. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the um, adolescent brain development and how um, how adolescents think that marijuana is harmless, and they don't really they don't believe that the brain chemistry is changed when they use marijuana at a young age, and you know how does that work? How does that word get out? Because I was, I'm a retired health teacher, but that was like the biggest problem in the last in the last years is that the students didn't believe that there was anything wrong with marijuana. They thought that alcohol was more harmful than marijuana, and if it does have this impact at a young age brain development, um, that needs to come from like more than just the health teachers who they don't really believe, you know they say oh, you're just saying that so we won't do it, but um, they need like. I think they need the intervention to come from, you know, like media and, you know, the message. Because, you know, it's, it's becoming legalized everywhere. If it has an impact on brain development and learning, how does, how are the communities going to deal with that? Well, part of the thing is we're kind of behind the curve here, is that 
people uh, are voting here are, are, are changing perceptions because they have this perception of it being healthy, you know, almost healthy, right? Because you know, it's medicine, it's healthy, it's good for you. Um, and so uh, we, we, we have, and, and part of it is the reason why that's happened is because the research, we haven't done a lot of good research in, on marijuana in particular. That study I showed just came out a couple of years ago. That's the best kind of long-term study we've ever done in any anyone's like it. And they started that in the 1970s. By the way, I didn't mention, the marijuana that they were smoking back then was a lot less potent than it is today, about two or three times the amount of active TFC is today in than it was back then. So you might actually, the, the, the effects may be, may be more harmful now than it was to get access to um, that's speculative, but it's not a bad assumption. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, you know, we need more studies like this with compelling data, uh, not just rhetoric or hearsay or bad view. We have to kind of show, or at least understand, is it really bad for people and in what ways? And then we need to get that across so that parents understand the ramifications of this. The other thing I didn't mention, of course, is <coughs> one thing I mentioned about this, uh, this gene by environment interaction. And with marijuana, there's something about marijuana which is strongly associated with psychosis. And it may turn on genes that wouldn't or ordinarily be turned on through exposure to something in something in cannabis, maybe it's THC, maybe it's one of the other cannabinoids that seems to affect genes that seem to um, increase the incidence of psychosis. But you've got to do a better job of doing more research and many more people now. Um, do research, but we kind of come to the to the party late in that regard. Um, so hopefully more research will be coming out. I know a number of my colleagues are actually doing research with marijuana, looking at the neurocognitive in back in San Diego, where I work now as general, one of my colleagues is, is doing that. She just published a study in neuropsychology about uh, three or four months ago, when all over the media that showed even with relatively small amounts of marijuana use, it actually changes the brain. Uh, you saw that study, yeah, that, that was one of, my, one of my colleagues, Jody Gilman, who headed that study. And so it is important to do these studies, and these take, take time and money to do, but we are starting to do them more now. So. I can add that in situation, as part of our coalition, we brought in Dr. Harris from Children's Hospital, who gave um, a presentation to parents at the high school. So it was you know, a required pre prom event, because they are getting in school, they're getting in health class, and other venues, but we're trying to get that message and that research, consistent with research about adolescent brain development. Now, the kids are starting younger and younger. Yeah. You know, they're like, it's junior high now. Mm -hmm. You know, there's six, seven eighth graders who experiment with marijuana because they hear this is nothing wrong with it. Right. And, you know, alcohol, the message is out on alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so now they're turning to, to marijuana. And I really think that, you know, part of the, um, the opioid problem results from the experimentation with marijuana, which, which is, you know, mostly illegal. And then they're looking for something a little a little more. And so they go into things like ecstasy, and then they say, oh, that's not bad. And then they try the opioids, and then yeah. it's, it's too late. So the education is really important, but I, I think that the younger the, the younger and the, the parent message of, you know, abstinence is the best choice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, just as an average person, as we're trying to turn that tanker real slow, what can the average person do? What are the best two most effective things that this is your average consensus to help you with that? Well, I think being vocal, writing to, 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 uh, your come to Congress, to your um, state and local representatives as well, um, and letting them know what's going on in your own community, um, how, how your own community is impacted. There is nothing like personal stories of your um, that will influence public policy. That's really what it has to change for The mm -hmm. only reason that we are now shifting is because there have been so many people sadly dying from opioid mm. That's what's really gotten the attention. And people just can't, can't ignore the tragedy of that. So, you know, 
we have to keep on speaking up and speaking out and letting people let your voice be heard. Yes, in the back. Could you explain a little bit what a recovery high school is? Like, does it just mean that it offers things like an, an AA group or an NA group? Like, how, how is it given that, that, that title? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's a specific environment. It's a high school environment. So it's <coughs> young people will go to uh, this recovery high school and get their education, but it's, it's, it's all about recovery. Oh, it's, it's so all, only people who have had only a people, substance abuse yeah. issue, they go to, okay. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so now there is a big study going on nationally. One of the things that we don't know for sure is whether that's the, the optimal model you know, to have separate recovery high schools versus some kind of regular high school but with a, you know, recovery support services embedded within within a high school. Um, so we don't know, we, we, that's what's being evaluated nationally right now, and we'll know more about that in a few years of time. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.